Okay. The Great War, World War I, the war to end all wars. And of course, it kind of is like an old joke now. By 2014, we know that didn't really work out so much. The causes of the Great War. Well, number one, we have to understand that though we call it the Great War or World War I, we can't negate the fact that Europe has been uh, a continent of flame for, for many centuries. With uh, ever since the concept of nation state emerge, these powers have fought each other over land, over faith. Monarchs are shared amongst them of the same family line. Uh, it is extremely dysfunctional. But what happens in World War I is you have a dysfunctionality that is polarized, so an us versus them situation, and technology can make it extra brutal. So the four conditions that lead to the Great War, as summarized back when you were in ninth grade, are Maine. All right, now Maine is best understood as militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. I actually treat them a little bit differently. Uh, imperialism, militarism, nationalism, alliances. As long as you are able to acknowledge that it is more than the fact that England wanted land or more than the fact that people had guns and steel or the fact that people got along in certain places and didn't get along with others, as long as you can make sure that you know that it's more than one, two, three factors, then you're good. Imperialism. Now, this is a competition among nations for colonies, resources, and markets. And this imperialism not only takes you off your continent, but brings you around the world as we understood um, the, the, early recon the early conquistadors were doing such. Um, but that was more for their own glory. And eventually during the mercantile era, you start to see nations doing it. And then you have uh, what we saw in the 1800s. Boy, I stumbled all over the place. Uh, examples of imperialism, you could say that 1899, um, the U.S. and the Philippines, you could say our efforts to get Panama and create the Panama Canal. Uh, Great Britain and France are very successful, while landlocked, quasi-landlocked nations like Germany and Austria struggle. Austria-Hungary expands south in its search for um, territory. And this is just an example, a very famous one. I've used it in different uh, slideshows where England has its land holdings around the world, thus the sun never shines on the great British Empire. Um, you see India and Canada. Let's go on. This is a neat one. 1914 colonial holdings. Sit on this for a while. Maybe you should hit pause. But you can see that the British are dominating. The British are winning. It is the largest empire ever. Now, obviously, not it is not landed, but it is the largest empire in sheer size. And you can see that the French are doing well. Algeria will know that quite well. And then up here, you get that neon green, and you see that neon green is only in drops around the world. Thus, Germany not doing as well. Now, besides the fact that they're competing for colonies, thus resources and markets, this is the era where guns are going to play uh, a role be at the national level. Now, militarism, desire of a people that they should maintain a strong military, capable and be prepared uh, to use it aggressively to defend and promote national interests. So if you take real politique, this concept of uh, doing what you need to do for your nation, and you have a gigantic big berthas to carry it out, you got militarism. The United States and its nuclear buildup in the 50s and 60s is a great exemplar of what militarism is, the arms race with the Soviet Union. Now, going back here, it's uh, the increased buildup of military spending and military forces is led by Great Britain and, and Germany. Uh, Germany, uh, its naval forces begin to rival that of Great Britain. Uh, it had to get more creative, of course, and instead of having gigantic fleets, it was creating its ute boats, its uter boats. Uh, of course, the increased size of most European armies, so it's one of those phrases where, all right, you got a military, any good military needs to be used. It needs to be used to protect national interests, be them economic, be them political, be them social. You need to use the military or you're not going to be able to justify having such a large, grandiose military. Nationalism. 
desire of a people to rule themselves. So you start to see people here in the Slavic region of Europe um, cunning wanting to break away from the yoke of its Germanic uh, rule by A.H. We had an example of a nationalism in our country in 1776. Well, when A.H. Austria-Hungary takes over Bosnia, shown here in a more modern day map, um, it kind of says to the Slavic world, we are here and we might take more. And of course, the Slavic world, shown here by Serbia, free and independent, feels threatened. Plus, Serbia wouldn't mind creating a Slavic region, thus a, a future Yugoslavia. And don't, re don't forget that all behind this are the Russians, always dreaming of this gigantic uh, Slavic empire dominated by their rule. So we got to remember that the nationalism here grows out when a Serbian nationalist group in uh, attacks royalty who's in, in, visiting Sarajevo. Now we're, you, you recognize all that. Alliance systems. To be honest, the alliance system that dominated Europe actually kept Europe at peace for much of the later part of the 1800s. There was tension and, you know, France and Germany can't get enough of each other, but drinking coffee. It, this power struggle between us and them kind of like equaled out. And anybody knew, knowing that a, if a war broke out, they knew it would be a large scale, terrible thing. So in a way, having that polarized world, like the Cold War, w created peace. No one could go to war, and that's, of course, unfortunately, what they did do. So let's review. Let's remember that the cause of the Great War are more than one, and being able to identify and explain these in written form and in multiple choice is a necessity. So here it is. The stage is set. Nationalism is growing here in Bosnia, which was forcibly under Austria-Hungary's rule. Remember that Germany, Austria-Hungary, largely a Germanic people, Germanic language, Germanic ethnicity, Germanic foods. They have now conquered or controlling a Slavic region of Bosnia. Now Serbia has ties. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so do remember it's a petty little thing that it was not Bosnian nationalists fighting for freedom and independence. It was actually Serbian nationalists fighting for their brethren, but also fighting for this greater Serbian cause. Oh my. So war actually breaks out with the assassination of this pimp out guy, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, in the summer of 1914. The Black Hand, Gavrilo Princip takes the final shot that actually wins the day. Gavrilo Princip will eventually go to jail, and he, I believe, will die in jail. Now, what actually comes out of this is wonderful Machiavellian stuff. Germany, actually, on the other side of age, is saying to Austria-Hungary, we have your back. We will give you what you need. We will fund you. We will give you supplies. We want you to go to war and lay the smack down there on Sarajevo. We want you to have a war with Russia, and we got your back. And this is all going to be for what they had hoped would be a land grab between Germany versus Russia. Here's your timeline. AH and Germany go to smack down on Serbia. Russia defends its Slavic country of Serbia. France supports its ally, Russia. Germany invades Belgium in an effort to attack France. And finally, the part of the continent that's off the continent, Great Britain, feels compelled to join the war effort. Thus, within weeks, in the summer of 1914, we've gone from a, an era of tension to an era of war. And I do want to make sure we understand all the it was it was just brewing. It was ready. 
But this summer event, the Archduke's assassination, is, is what was the tipping point. It's kind of dramatic in a way. And if you start thinking about what's going on with Ukraine right now and Vladimir Putin and stuff, not to get off topic too much, it does make you wonder, to what degree would it take for the NATO organized world to rise up to defend Ukraine? All right, I'm taking another sip. Now, as you know, we don't join it. Our initial response, we want to be neutral. We had a tradition of isolation going all the way back to the George W., uh, sorry, George Washington. We also wanted to protect our trade, knowing that if war broke out there, we get to, you know, sell them the guns, sell them the weaponry, sell them the food. We also had European roots. We had European roots all the way with Russia because of the new immigration that had occurred from 1880 to 1920. But of course, we had our brethren there in Great Britain. Great cartoon, right? Now, from 1914 through 1916, we have uh, Woodrow Wilson, who is an uber progressive and wants to spread progressivism around Latin America. He feels compelled to join the war effort, but knows he does not have the political ground to join it. In fact, his campaign slogan in 1916 is, he kept us out of war for a few more months. <laughs> so, the war in Europe is slow. Kaiser Wilhelm is attacking quickly France, but then things teeter out and what we see is a stalemate of trench warfare. Now, the United States is concerned because this slow war in Europe might suck us in. If it was a one-year war, a four-year war, it's completely different. So, maybe over time we will be compelled to join. Now, why not to join? It's very simple. This is what no man's land looked like between the, what's that called? The trenches, plus right here. We were in a blockading situation, selling equipment and weaponry and, and food stuff, sorry, to Germany, and we were being blockaded by our own ally. Now, besides the British blockade with our ally, we were, we were also... Um, being attacked by U-boats. So, I mean, in every way, the United States should stay out of it because all we want to do is make a couple bucks and we want to sell some of our stuff and we don't want to choose sides, even though we were quickly choosing sides. I'm sorry if I stuttered over myself there. I should have rehearsed, right? Now, in terms of that unrestricted submarine warfare, you got to love this. This was uh, taken out in the newsprint in the United States in 1915 before we joined the war. Kind of threatening the United States to not support the countries that are at war with Germany. Now, we were selling foodstuffs to Great Britain. We were bringing passengers to Great Britain, but under a lot of the merchant and passenger vessels, we had weapons of war. So the Germans knew this. Thus, even though they might have been passenger vessels, they were, all, they were put in harm's way. I think you guys will recognize this. Now, in terms of international law, you are to um, ask a ship you're about to sink. So you're a German U-boat. You're about to sink the Her Majesty's ship Lusitania. You're supposed to take all people off the ship. And then you have, if you feel that there's weaponry there, just cause to sink it. But you got to get the people off. And what was happening in unrestricted submarine warfare is the, the U-boats didn't want to expose themselves. Even though ships like the Lusitania were gunned, they were gunned, the, the, the German U-boats said, we're not going to expose ourselves. And unrestricted submarine warfare starts to break international law. Hundreds of Amer 100 Americans are killed. Now start going back in time. When you kill Americans or foreigners... There is going to be a reaction. Think about the USS Maine and Havana Harbor. Think about the boxers and the Boxer Rebellion. Think about the Opium War. And of course, think about the Lusitania. Now, we still came out in 1915 saying we are too proud to fight. We are too, you know, city on a hill type of nation to fight. And we'll see how much longer that lasts, right? So the U.S. is concerned, but actually even getting attacked, we don't join. Oh, sorry. Now, you know we're going to get to this. So, one of the things that was keeping the war effort successful in, in Europe 
was the fact that the Russians and the Germans were fighting, and there's a lot of bloodshed. Uh, lines are moving, but at the end of the day, it gives us hope that as long as Germany is fighting a two-front war against France, Great Britain, and Russia, that the war is going to come to a close and we don't really need to intervene. Well, confusion and delay occurs with Tsar Nicholas II abdicating his throne. His people were getting crushed. They wanted change. They wanted him out. Um, and of course, thereafter, a true communist or Bolshevik revolution occurs. So in the chaos that was World War II, World War One, we see the dramatic fallout in, I couldn't call Russia an ally, but somebody who was keeping peace. One of the biggest things that Vladimir Lenin wanted to do and had support of the people with was to actually quit World War One. So what you start to see is Russia quits World War One, makes its peace, gives up its land, and now there is a true one front war against France and Britain, our true allies. Now, we're not in the war yet. It really does come down to this. When the United States is directly threatened um, by the Germans to work with the Mexicans, who we were not at peace with, you have to understand that this is a type of time period of banditry going on in Mexico, where you have Pancha Villa and you have confusion and delay in Mexico, and it's trickling to our country, and in a very progressive mode, um, Woodrow Wilson is sending troops down to Mexico. So... It's not like we were at peace with Mexico, but the last thing we wanted is some sort of alliance that was coming from across the ocean. <sighs> so, when you add all of this, the Zimmerman telegram, unrestricted submarine warfare, the, the future of Russia seeming to be faulted, and the fact that England and France truly needing our support, our troop support, not just our equipment and food, we are becoming very, very concerned. And you tie this all on to Woodrow Wilson and his make the world safe for democracy attitude. Don't mind this, okay. Um, moral diplomacy, pl diplomacy is something that a lot of our presidents have practiced. It's this idea that we will go around the world to help free people be free. Not because of communism, that's kind of the Truman Doctrine, but just because we want them to be free. And here we see uh, a dictator, you know, whatever. We see tyrants. We see the idea of oppressed people. So he has a solution. Let's join the war. The world must be made safe for democracy. Its peace must be planted upon the tested foundations of political liberty. We have no selfish ends to serve. We have does no desire of conquest, no dominion. We seek no indemnities for ourselves, no material compensation for the sacrifices we shall freely make. We are but one of the champions of the rights of mankind. You like that? It's very enlightened thinking there. We shall be satisfied when those rights have been made as secure as the faith and the freedom of nations can make that. You may not like Woodrow Wilson, but the guy was speaking a, a 17th century, 18th century enlightened attitude that it was hard to not rally behind. This is his war message. The United States declares war. Now, once we join the war, what's it look like? Well, a lot of you uh, will remember my trench warfare activity from when you were in ninth grade. So here are the bad guys, the central powers. Here are the good guys in green. You like that? I like to generalize. Nice and easy. So trench warfare, I am really, really going to let you just pause on this because this, these are actually notes that you guys saw when you were younger, when we did that activity. So I know you guys probably want to do it in class again. So I'll get to how trench warfare emerged. Isn't that nice? It's such a bad visual. All right, the Great War. So first of all, when Germany was declaring itself involved in conflict, what it believed it could do, now this is back before the United States joined, was that it wanted to take out Paris, the easy prey, sorry, French, and then conquer Moscow. The von Schlieffen plan was to go through some of the weaker part of Belgium, fly in and hit Paris. This was too built up. 
and it had already been a suspected play, place for war because it's been a place for war in the past. And um, the thing is, when Germany quickly went through Belgium to attack Paris, it brought in the British. By bringing in the British, I would almost liken the fact that Germany had sealed its fate. Now, right here is the Marne River, and outside Paris, outside the Marne, we will see trenches be dug, dug for a long period of time. Trenches that are going to be, you know, moved here and there, but be utilized for months at a time, for year at a time. At the first Battle of the Marne alone, there were 500,000 casualties. Thus, this war is going to be the war to end all wars, comma, we hope. Now, in the water, we kind of looked at this, the Battle of the Jutland. I believe this is Jutland right here on the top of Denmark. So the Battle of Jutland is the waterway right here outside Jutland. Um, and yeah, it was a naval engagement, but I don't want to make it sound like it's World War II level naval engagement. Now, how about those Russians? Look at what those Russians did right here. You have Russia. You have the chaos that was going on with millions dying in Russia. Russia has a revolution. Russia gives up this territory. In order to get peace with Germany, they literally give up this. And here you see the Ukraine, thus, I mean, Kievian Rus. I mean, we're going back generations here, but the Russians want stability in their own nation. Now, this stalemate that was going on the Western Front is going to continue for years. On the Eastern Front, there is peace being made, but this doesn't make anything better on the Western Front. So you have the Battle of Verdun. Uh, what's that? Right here. The Battle of the Somme. Right here. Battle of Ypres. Right here. And at, the, at, at some point, the U.S. joins. So look at it. Some of the biggest battles that we know in the record books, Verdun, Somme, and Ypres, they were all fought and over by the time the United States joins. Now, I'm not trying to downplay the United States here. We did join. We brought men and material with us. We brought fresh, healthy soldiers. We brought an intimidating number of soldiers. Thus, Germany, not running out of boys, is going to have a hard time fighting this war. But look, we come at the tail end. And trust me, Europe knows this. The Spring Offensive was Germany's last attempt in 1918 to wage a war, grab some land, and see how positive it could end it. Well, it failed with Germany suffering uh, hundreds of thousands of casualties. And when it's suffering these hundreds of thousands of casualties, it's really running out of the ability to fight a war in the spring of 1918, causing turmoil at home. Peace needs to begin to be discussed and we could understand that with Kaiser Wilhelm going to flee the nation and eventually uh, uh, the government moving to Weimar and a new republic being formed that is going to try to make a peace and create a stability in its own nation. Now, there were other people involved in World War II, World War I, whatever this is called. So the fall of 1918, Bulgaria gets nervous and quits. The fall of 1918, uh, the Ottoman Empire is going to finally fall. The sick man of Europe is now dead. Now, in, in the end of the Ottoman Empire, Britain and France are going to take Iraq, or what will soon be Iraq and soon be Israel slash Palestine, soon going to be you know the Lebanon and Syria we know. Turkey will be quickly granted freedom and independence, thus the new country of Turkey. By the fall of 1918, A.H. has seen the writing on the wall. He is not going to be willing to lose any more land or men. Germany's alone on the 11th day, the 11th hour, the 11th month, 11th second, 11th, you know, millimeter. An armistice is signed. An armistice is a truce. Just because an armistice is signed, it's going to take months and months and months for an actual treaty to be finalized. 
War is over, peace begins. So, why did Germany lose the war? Is there one more? There you go. These are all good, valid reasons. Hello, Daddy. Max just came in. Hey, Max. Not me, speak up. Oh, that's cool. I was almost done a lecture. I was going to talk about the Treaty of Versailles to my students at minute 25. My well, mom is home. All right, I think we're going to end it there. I'll do the Treaty of Versailles uh, a little bit later. See ya.